Hello and welcome to the next lecture in my series on drugs in the nervous system. Whereas last time I focused on the peripheral nervous system, this time I'm going to focus on the central nervous system, as you can see here from the title of the lecture. So you can consider this a continuing introduction to the nervous system, at least in very general terms, uh, the structures and functions of the nervous system, and uh, with an eye towards how these structures and functions are affected by the use of various drugs. So here is a, a diagram that kind of captures where we were last time and moves us forward to this time. You can see various aspects of the peripheral nervous system in blue there. Um, clearly a live detail that I didn't get to last time and is some of which, much of which is beyond the scope of this class. Uh, but then you can see in pink and red here the spinal cord and the brain, the central nervous system. And that's really what we're going to focus on uh, today. Here's a nice picture of the brain. Um, as I was looking for images for this lecture, I, of course, I was looking for pictures of brains and I was reminded of how when I first began my undergrad education many, many years ago, um, the school that I went to had a fairly large collection of human brains in large uh, jars housed appropriately enough in the psychology building. And I used to see these brains um, almost every day when I went to classes. And probably like a lot of people, I found myself staring at them wondering and, and fascinated by the idea that all of uh, who we are, all of our thoughts, and our feelings, our motivations to behave in one way or the other, our, our dreams, if you will, our loves, all that stuff is in some way instantiated in this rather, um, you know, odd looking pile of mushy stuff, gray, mushy, folded stuff. Here, of course, we've got coloring, which is not natural to the brain, but uh, stuff that you, you know, a little bit bigger than a softball, maybe a little bit smaller than a large cantaloupe, depending on how dehydrated it is, uh, the brain. And it really, you know, maybe it was that early experience of looking at those brains that really got me thinking a lot about psychology and about neurobiology and really encouraged me in, in much of my studies later on. Now, there's an enormous amount of information in the field of neurobiology uh, that I'm not going to uh, cover right now, but I do hope that some why cover is interesting to you and, and is useful and gets you thinking, maybe even inspired as, as much as I was all those many years ago. As I go forward in this lecture, an important point to keep in mind, and I'll actually return to this at the very end of the lecture, is just simply that drug experiences, you know, the type of psychoactive drug experiences that we're interested in, have a lot to do with how drugs influence different parts of the brain, different structures within the brain and elsewhere in the nervous system, but, but especially in the brain and how drugs disrupt the normal functions of these systems and these structures. So, you know, your brain is doing an enormous amount of stuff right now as you're listening to me or as you're walking through your day-to-day -day life. There are a myriad of different functions which are being accomplished by different systems and structures within your ner nervous system, especially within your brain. When you use drugs, those systems and structures are disrupted in one way or the other, they're influenced, and the functions which they're normally carrying out are changed or altered, at least temporarily. And that in, in large part informs what the drug experience is like for you. So my goal then is to highlight some of the basic uh, structures and systems within the brain in this lecture and talk in general terms about the functions that those structures and systems have. That way, when you think about drugs, you'll have a general sense, if you know where a drug is most active, the type of effects that it might have on the brain. And later on in this class, as I go to further lectures where I focus on one particular drug or another, I'll try to return to this idea of looking at structures and functions within the nervous system, especially within the brain, that are influenced by drugs. And uh, hopefully that will create kind of a coherent picture for you at least in general terms, about the uh, the neurobiology of drug effects. So first off, if we're thinking about the human brain, or really almost all brains, certainly all mammal brains, uh, we can begin kind of at the bottom or kind of at the back uh, with a set of structures which we can call uh, collectively the hindbrain or sometimes the brain stem. You can see these structures in this picture here. We have uh, the medulla and the pons, 
the cerebellum, kind of buried within the medulla is the reticular formation. These are a set of structures which we kind of group together in a system which are responsible for a lot of different functions. But in general, we could say that these functions all or mostly have to do with autonomic survival. This is, in a sense, um, the most basic or, or maybe the most important part of your brain. This is what keeps uh, the lights on, keeps, keeps your body running, keeps your heart beating, keeps your lungs moving to oxygenate your blood, keeps you swallowing, keeps you doing a lot of the different things that are really important just to keep you alive, to keep you surviving. So if we look at the reticular formation, we can see uh, some examples of, of how that works. Uh, reticular meaning net-like. Uh, the reticular formation isn't really just in one tiny localized area of, of the hindbrain. It actually spreads out net-like. It's a set of, um, of neurons which project uh, into other parts of the brain, into higher parts of the brain, if you will. And that gives you a clue right away as to uh, how the structure of that particular part of the brain informs its function. The reticular formation kind of spreads out and connects to other parts of the brain and in general uh, is responsible for arousing or, or calming or relaxing different other parts of the brain. So your overall uh, level of arousal in terms of the brain, how much the other parts of the brain, the other structures are of the brain are accomplishing their functions, how much they're turned on or turned off, has a lot to do with the reticular formation. And if you want to dig back into the history, there's actually some really classic research on the reticular formation, on the hindbrain in general, that goes way back to the 1940s, where uh, researchers uh, found that if they implanted an electrode in the reticular formation of a non-human animal, for instance, like a cat, they could stimulate that part of the brain by passing a very small amount of current into it, and that would cause the animal to wake up. Um, they also found that if they severed or destroyed that par portion of the brain, if they passed a lot of current into it such that the, uh, the structure of that nervous tissue was destroyed, then the animal, you know, the cat, the rat, whatever they were working with, would lapse into a coma. It would, uh, you know, immediately lose all consciousness, lose all overall functioning, and could even uh, go ahead and just die. So the reticular formation and other structures in the hindbrain are kind of responsible for keeping you going, keeping you turned on and going. Um, here's just a, another picture. If it wasn't obvious from the previous one, uh, I included uh, this picture just to kind of illustrate that this part of the brain, or uh, these these structures within the brain, this system that I'm calling the hind brain or the brain stem, is in a sense like the stem of of the brain. You know, when when I say brain, probably what most people think of is this kind of folded uh, cortex, which of course we're familiar with from pictures, or if you've taken a good biology class, you may have done um, done a uh, a dissection of a brain. Um, that brain, or what you're imagining, sits on top of, or is kind of is sort of fit on top of this deeper, older, both evolutionarily and um, ontogenetically older structure, the brainstem. Okay, so elsewhere in the hindbrain we find uh, the medulla. The medulla is also responsible, <clears throat> a little bit like the reticular formation, for um, for uh, governing uh, important um, autonomic functions, important involuntary functions. I said before that the reticular formation controls your overall level of kind of arousal. The medulla does some of that too, but is also responsible for various involuntary functions like uh, heart rate, breathing, and swallowing. Uh, again, if you uh, damage this part of the brain, um, if you have a very severe stroke in this part of the brain that damages the tissue, or if you have a severe injury that damages the brain stem, like a you know, bad motorcycle accident where your head is whipped back and forth very suddenly, you could lose uh, these functions. And if you if you do, and if you don't have a very quick and very good medical um, support, your, your body will die. Uh, even if uh, your body doesn't die, it may be necessary to you know, keep your body alive by stimulating your heart rate, stimulating your breathing, um, using various uh, life support devices. So a very important part of the brain, when this brain part of the brain uh, fails, this structure fails, the functions that keep you alive fail as well. Um, drugs which uh, 
massively deactivate this part of the brain can be fatal. So if you overdose on heroin, if you overdose on alcohol, and you lapse into a coma, and then you continue to sort of de go down and your heart rate slows down, your breathing slows down, you lose the ability to swallow and die, it's because the functions in this part of the brain and the structure and the related structures in this part of the brain are no longer uh, active. They're no longer doing what they're supposed to be doing. Yet another structure I want to highlight uh, is the pons. Uh, pons, a little bit like the medulla, is uh, responsible for various involuntary functions, you know, sleep being one of them. You know, all these different structures which are in the same localized area, the same system in the brain, share a lot of the same tasks or, or functions or, jo or jobs. Uh, so the pons does a lot of the same stuff that the medulla does. Um, like the reticular formation, the pons sends axons to different parts of the brain. Um, and like the reticular formation, it's, it's responsible for uh, your level of arousal, um, especially uh, whether or not you're asleep or awake. Um, and of course, you can imagine drugs which deactivate this part of the brain have an effect on your overall level of arousal. So I've already kind of touched on this point, but I'll, I'll address it again. Uh, why this is interesting, uh, why this is important to think about, is that we know that different drugs will tend to either activate or deactivate the various structures in the hindbrain, in the brainstem. And you can imagine that a drug which activates the functioning of, of these different structures will tend to increase your overall level of alertness, increase your overall level of activity. So in this case here, we've got a picture of cocaine. Cocaine is uh, classed as a stimulant for very good reason. When people take cocaine, they typically feel very energetic, very alert, uh, very active, or at least like they want to be very active. In my last lecture, I uh, mentioned and I linked to a video clip from the movie Wolf of Wall Street, in which uh, two of the main characters are using crack cocaine, and after using it, just want to go run. They just they want to go running off into the distance uh, because they're so alert and active. Well, cocaine and other stimulants that we'll talk about later in the semester have a fairly strong effect on the hindbrain, really, you know, cranking up the activity of that part of the brain and consequently increasing the activity of other parts of the brain that the structures in the hindbrain connect to. You know, sort of the flip side of that would be various drugs which we class as depressants. So drugs which tend to decrease activity in the hindbrain have effects on, uh, decrease the functions that those um, structures accomplish, uh, you know, even to the point of uh, dangerous uh, toxic uh, consequence. So for instance, if, if you take a great deal of alcohol, um, if, you, you know, if you take heroin, if you take uh, sedative hypnotics like quaaludes, I, I provided a link on Blackboard to a video clip from that same movie, Wolf of Wall Street, about the use of quaaludes. Uh, these are all drugs which we sometimes class as depressants for good reason. They tend to decrease overall activity of the central and peripheral nervous system. Uh, part of the we, reason that they do this is that they tend to deactivate the various structures of the hindbrain with the consequence that the functions accomplished by these structures no longer occur as, as, uh, in as robust a fashion. So again, if you drink a very large amount of alcohol, um, you will uh, unfortunately read in the newspaper or see online from time to time in the news stories of people who die from alcohol poisoning. Sometimes the reason this happens is if you take enough alcohol into your system, your hindbrain just doesn't work as well as it should. It doesn't provide the appropriate signaling to your heart and to your diaphragm to keep your heart beating and keep your uh, lungs breathing and you can, you can basically uh, asphyxiate. Um, so not, not at all pleasant to think about, but interesting to think about, and it gives us some important information as to how different classes of drugs have the effects that they, that they have. So another structure that I haven't yet got to in the brainstem is the cerebellum. Cerebellum is, uh, is kind of interesting and, and somewhat specialized. Um, cerebellum means little brain, and it kind of makes sense that it's called that. It looks a bit like a little brain, sort of tacked on to the back of your, your regular brain, like your spare brain, uh, if you will. Um, I don't know if that joke works, but there it is. Uh, the, the cerebellum has the important uh, function of coordinating of a lot of your movements, a lot of the activities that your body engages in, especially voluntary movements. 
So if you think about it, even the simple activity of typing on your computer or picking up a cup of coffee from your desk and sipping it or getting up to walk across your room, things which most of us take for granted occur as a function of a great deal of coordination between all the little muscle movements that have to happen to get you up and moving, uh, to sustain your movement. If you play a musical instrument, if you engage in any sorts of sports, if you like to dance, any of the things that of course many of us do maybe without thinking about it too much, you're benefiting from the activity of your cerebellum. Your, the ability of the cerebellum to organize all the different motor signals that your brain is producing so that they occur in the right time, in the right sequence, and you can, you know, you can get to where you need to go or you can move in the way that you want to move. Um, years ago I remember going to a party with a, a good friend of mine. Uh, it was a, a grad school party and a bunch of people including myself were drinking a fair bit of alcohol and a friend of mine who's a neurobiologist uh, stumbled across the room and said laughingly that he had cerebellar disorder. Um, in a sense he was right. The alcohol he was using was disrupting the activity of his cerebellum, disrupting the activity or the function of that structure, the cerebellum, with the consequence that his movement was becoming discoordinated. So again, if we think about some of the different effects that alcohol has, uh, one of them is that it decreases activity in uh, the cerebellum with the consequence that the functions of the cerebellum are disrupted. And we see things like loss of coordination and movement, slurred speech. Uh, that's an interesting example of um, a coordinated set of behaviors. You think about all the different muscles which have to work in just the right sequence to produce the air passing out of your lungs through your uh, windpipe and through your vocal uh, cords and up through your mouth and your mouth has to move in just such a way as to create clear and coherent speech. Um, the cerebellum is involved with that when the cerebellum's activities are disrupted, when those functions are disrupted, we have slurring or stumbling mumbling in speech. Um, it's interesting, I, I suppose, to think about this. Uh, it's summertime when I'm recording this video right now. Um, I, obviously, this is a season where a lot of people go to weddings, and I can't help but think about how when you go to a wedding, you sometimes see people you know, at the end of the wedding at the reception when the DJ starts playing music or the band starts playing music and people are looking around. You get a sense that folks want to start dancing, but maybe they feel a bit shy. Perhaps some people, like myself, don't consider um, themselves to be great dancers. You have a little bit of alcohol in your system. It can kind of make your movements feel a little bit more loose and limber. That can actually feel encouraging. Like you could get on the dance floor and think, yeah, I, I got this. I, I can dance after a drink or two. Of course, if you drink more than one or two drinks, if you have quite a few, as people sometimes do at weddings, you become the guy or the girl who's stumbling around the dance floor, sort of flopping all over themselves, bumping into people. Not very cool. You become the person who wants to give a, a, a toast to the bride or to the groom, and you slur and stumble and mumble over what you're saying. I guess the lesson here is, is sometimes true, this is often true for drugs, I suppose, is that if you take enough of them, they can have some uh, unpleasant um, effects on you. And just alcohol's effects, specifically on the cerebellum, uh, are probably a good example of that. So, okay, I've covered um, some of the different structures in the hindbrain, or what we sometimes call the brainstem. I hope you have a sense in, in general what these structures do, what their what their functions are. Let's kind of move, if you can imagine, uh, you know, your mind's eye, you're sort of thinking about the brain. We're going to move kind of forwards and upwards into a portion of the brain which we call the midbrain. Now, the midbrain uh, contains a variety of different structures, and uh, I'm going to highlight a few of them in the next slide or two. Or really, I'm going to focus on uh, really just one in the next slide or two. Uh, before I do, though, a point I should really make is this, this broad distinction between the hindbrain and the midbrain and the forebrain, which I haven't got to yet, um, is in a sense an artificial distinction. You know, if you were looking at a brain, if you were dissecting a brain on the on a, the desk in front of you, it's not like you would see a clear demarcation between, well, here's, this is the hindbrain, this is the midbrain, this is the forebrain. These are distinctions which neurologists and neurobiologists, anatomists and physiologists have made over the years because it helps them to 
simplify and clarify some of the different structures and some of the different broad sets of functions that those structures have. So you think about the the uh, the structures and functions in the hindbrain. Uh, they're mostly to do with kind of basic maintenance of arousal, survival, and coordination. If you think about the structures and the functions in the midbrain, a lot of them have to do with kind of initiating or activating behavior. And so I'm going to focus on just one structure right now. That's called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra does a number of different things really, um, but among them it helps us kind of plan and coordinate uh, goal-directed behaviors. The substantia nigra is actually part of a larger group of structures which are sometimes called the basal ganglia. Um, I'm not going to get into all of those right now, but suffice it to say that these structures are necessary for initiating and kind of beginning to coordinate voluntary behavior. So I'm sitting here at a desk, every so often I have to reach forward and tap the space bar on my computer to advance the slide. That's a goal-directed behavior, as modest as it may sound. It's just simply I have to develop, in a sense, the idea to initiate my hand. You know, my arm lifts up, my hand moves forward, my finger reaches, it taps the key, good. Um, that's, you know, that, that kind of initiation of that uh, and planning and initiation of that activity is accomplished by some of the structures in the midbrain, including among them the substantia nigra. What's interesting to notice is that drugs, some drugs, can affect the activity of uh, these structures and can even damage these structures. So uh, cocaine is an example of a drug where if you use enough of it, um, it will eventually start to damage uh, parts of the basal ganglia, including the substantia nigra. And the consequence of that, or a consequence of that, is that the functions accomplished by those structures no longer work as well as they really should. And so if you see people uh, who have abused cocaine for many years, they sometimes have uh, behavioral effects that look a lot like Parkinson's disease. So you know, perhaps you have an older relative, a grandparent, an aunt, uncle, whatever, who has Parkinson's disease. Perhaps you've seen um, on television or on the internet, the actor Michael J. Fox, who's an activist for research into Parkinson's disease. If you've seen any of these people, you know that Parkinson's disease, uh, among its other symptoms, will involve a kind of a tremor in behavior, a kind of a shakiness, often in the arms and hands. Uh, people who have Parkinson's disease often have difficulty kind of moving. They'll have, they'll stumble and stoop as they, they walk. They may have difficulty speaking, not in the sense of slurring or stumbling like what we saw with the cerebellum, but more like they can't quite get started on speaking. So they may stutter almost, or they have difficulty kind of starting to move. They'll, they'll kind of uh, hesitate and, and shake as they begin to walk or begin to reach. Uh, I have a picture here of the, um, uh, of the former uh, singer of uh, Black Sabbath and certainly uh, otherwise famous for his own work, uh, singer Ozzy Osbourne. Um, this is an old reference, but you know, quite a few years ago, MTV had a television show, one of those reality TV shows about Ozzy Osbourne and his family of, of strange you know, children and his wife and all the stuff that they got into. It was interesting to watch that show, I actually thought, because uh, Ozzy Osbourne seemed to have some of these symptoms. Now, he may have had, uh, you know, for instance, when he spoke, he, he kind of stuttered as he began to speak. When he moved, he often seemed to tremble and shake a little bit as he, as he walked or as he would reach out to pick up something. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a neurologist. Obviously, haven't met with him to do a proper diagnosis. But I was suspicious in watching that that uh, you know, Ozzy, a, uh, a famously heavy user of cocaine for decades and decades of his life, might be suffering from Parkinson's disease-like symptoms as re as a result of damage to his basal ganglia, particularly to his substantia nigra, from using all that cocaine. All right, so that was just a little bit about the midbrain. There's a lot more going on in the midbrain, but I'm going to kind of work forward into the forebrain. The forebrain has a lot going on here, and we're actually only looking at part of the forebrain. If you, if you imagine, you know, move your mind's eye, we've kind of moved further forward and upward into the brain. We're now kind of in the almost the center of the brain, if you picture a brain in, in your, your mind's eye. Um, and we have a, a group of structures which are collectively called the limbic system. Limbic meaning lying on the boundary or the border between what's the midbrain and the hindbrain and what is the forebrain. 
Uh, these limbic structures are things like what you see here, you know, the uh, amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus. These have a very diverse set of functions, but they involve things like emotions and memory. So I'm going to highlight a few of these structures and functions within the forebrain, and then we'll move even further forward and talk about the rest of the forebrain. So here is the hippocampus. Hippocampus from the Greek word seahorse. And if you look at the image there, you can you know kind of imagine that the hippocampus, there are really two you know sides of it. Each side looks a bit like a kind of a curvy seahorse inside your head. <laughs> the seahorse or the hippocampus uh, controls some aspects of memory, particularly it seems taking information which is in short-term or working memory and instantiating it or putting it into long-term memory. So your ability to take, hopefully, what you're hearing right now, or what you're reading on the screen, which is temporarily in your working memory, your short-term memory, and to put it into long-term memory so that later on, days or weeks or even months or years down the line, you can remember what I'm telling you about the hippocampus or whatever else. That has to do with the ability of the hippocampus to do its job. That is one of the, the major functions of that structure. And we know this because damage to the hippocampus will damage the ability to form long-term memories. So people who have strokes, uh, where a blood vessel in the brain bursts and damages part of the brain structure or it cuts off blood supply and the part of the brain structure dies, if that occurs in the hippocampus, we see uh, very specific memory deficits where people can remember things for a very short period of time but can't form good long-term memories. Um, that can occur from injury uh, as well. Um, I'd say, uh, not exactly an old movie, but a movie that was out maybe sort of five or ten years ago, uh, the movie Memento, if you saw that, it's one of my favorite movies actually. Uh, it's a movie in which um, a man is trying to solve a, a mystery, a mystery involving the murder of his wife, uh, but he's suffered an injury, um, I don't know if he was shot or hit in the head with something, but suffice it to say, uh, he is unable to form long-term memories. He can remember things for short periods of time as he's kind of working on them or thinking about them, but as soon as he stops actively thinking about whatever the clue is that he's found, it vanishes from his memory, or it is he is not able to put it into long-term memory. Um, it's tempting to think in watching that movie that probably part of the problem is his hippocampus was damaged. We think about this in the context of drugs, we'll return to alcohol again. You'll see in my lectures I often talk about alcohol, partly because it's a drug that I've studied a fair bit in graduate school, also because it's a drug which is, you know, fairly commonly available and which a lot of people use, and which can have uh, both some positive or beneficial effects, I suppose, but also can have some very uh, negative or damaging effects, uh, clearly. So alcohol, it, among its other effects, it will decrease the activity in various parts of the brain, in various structures of the brain, including the hippocampus. And if you drink enough alcohol, you can suffer <clears throat> from full-on impairment of formation of long-term memory. You can have what's commonly called a blackout. Now, sometimes when people drink alcohol, they'll later on say, oh yeah, I can't quite remember what all we got up to last night, or oh, I can't believe I was talking to so-and-so at the party, and they can claim to have impaired memory, like I don't quite remember what I was saying. That may be due to decreased activity in the hippocampus, but blackout is more than that, and if you've ever had a lot of alcohol to drink, you may unfortunately have experienced this. This is where you have no memory, not even a little memory. This is where you wake up in the morning and you're like, where am I? Why am I you know, lying in someone's bathtub. Where is my, where are my pants? How did I get here? I mean, you have to get up and kind of sort through the clues to lead you to understand how you got to wherever you got because you drank so much alcohol that all the stuff you were doing last night or you know, wherever, whenever it was that you were drinking, all of that stuff is lost. It never made it into long-term memory. Um, I'll try and provide a link to a, uh, there's a song by the <clears throat> hip hop artist Atmosphere that talks a little bit about this, about having you know, w uh, the main character of the song wakes up from a blackout and has to kind of piece together the events that led her to wake up in the place where she woke up. Anyway, a good example, I think, of how um, impairment of uh, of the functioning of a particular structure in the brain, in this case the hippocampus, leads to a specific outcome that we associate with abuse of a specific drug, in this case blackouts from alcohol.
Elsewhere in the forebrain, specifically in the limbic system, we have the amygdala, amygdala meaning almond shaped, and you can see the amygdala, which again, like the hippocampus, there's actually sort of two parts to it. It sort of looks vaguely almond shaped. The amygdala is responsible for a lot of different uh, uh, functions, most of which have to do with emotions, especially emotions like anger and aggression and emotions like fear. So we find that uh, drugs which deactivate or decrease the activity of um, this part of the brain uh, can have effects on uh, emotions, especially on fear. Um, you know, I didn't create a slide for this, um, at least not the time that I'm doing this recording, but some of the research that actually I did in graduate school looked at the effect of alcohol on the amygdala. And if you drink in enough alcohol, you start to decrease the activity of the amygdala. And um, one of the consequences of this is people show less fear response to threatening stimuli. So if you're in a laboratory in one of my studies, I might uh, give you a dose of alcohol and a beverage and then show you on the computer screen a series of very threatening images, like pictures of people pointing weapons at you or pictures of animals or sna you know, snakes and spiders and things which most people find kind of scary or a little threatening. Um, and there are different ways to measure how active the amygdala is during those moments. Research that's looked at this finds that generally, <clears throat> at least if you get to a high enough dose of alcohol, you see decreased activity in different parts of the amygdala, which is consistent with the idea that alcohol kind of can blunt your fear response, at least at high enough levels of dose. Elsewhere in the, uh, in the forebrain, in the limbic system, we have the hypothalamus, which you can see pictured here. Like the amygdala, like other parts of the limbic system, the hypothalamus has a lot to do with emotions. Um, at the risk of simplifying things a little bit, we'll just focus on the idea that uh, it's responsible for helping us develop motivations uh, for uh, behavior. So the, your sense of being motivated to go do something, to pursue a reward, to pursue escape from a, a threatening punish, a threat or a punishment, that has to do with the activity of the hypothalamus. And um, I think I have a slide elsewhere in this lecture, or it might be in the next lecture, where I talk about how um, if we stimulate parts of the hypothalamus, so for instance, if we um, we're doing research with a, a non-human animal like a rat or a mouse, we can implant an electrode all the way through the skull, all the way through the brain into the hypothalamus, and we can deliver small amounts of electricity, electric current into the hypothalamus to activate it, but not destroy the stu structure, kind of get it moving, get it, get it working. When we do this, we find that um, the experience, the behavior that the animal shows is consistent with being rewarded, being a uh, you know, being sort of satisfied with the behavior. So if you uh, wire up a mouse inside a test box such that every time it presses a lever on the wall, a small current will pass into its hypothalamus, you'll find that the rat will consistently press that lever, like it's being rewarded for that behavior. It feels perhaps good to the mouse, although it's impossible to know exactly how it feels, but it clearly seems like it's rewarding for the mouse to have that stimulation. And of course, that makes us think a lot about the motivations that people have to use various drugs. You know, some drugs seem to be fairly addictive. It's possible, it's likely, and there's some research to support the idea that those drugs which are very addictive tend to activate areas in the forebrain, in the limbic system, especially the hypothalamus, such that people feel a kind of a sense of reward for doing the behavior of using that drug. Whether it's cocaine, whether it's nicotine, whether it's alcohol, the drugs which we think of as being fairly addictive often uh, have uh, effects or, or you know, increase activity within these reward centers within the forebrain, especially within the limbic system. So I've talked about a few structures in the limbic system, which is usually thought of as part of the forebrain. Now let's kind of move even further upwards and, and forwards and outwards in our mind's eye and think about the cortex. The cortex is that wrinkly folded lumpy mass of the brain, which is what most people think of when, when they hear the word brain, that kind of flops over and mostly covers all the other stuff I've mentioned. So it's kind of like lying in a sloppy mess on top of all these other structures, that's your cortex. And the cortex is incredibly complicated. And of all the structures or all the systems within the brain, we know probably the least about the cortex, at least most parts of the cortex. But we can divide the cortex into different lobes.
lobes. If you've taken a good psychology or biology class, you're familiar with some of these, frontal lobe, parietal, temporal, occipital lobe. And we know that some of the different, uh, we know some of the different functions that these different structures, these, these different lobes or regions within the cortex have. Now, we could spend a whole lecture, we could spend a whole semester, we could probably spend you could spend your whole career just studying different parts of the cortex. Plenty of people do. For our purposes, let's keep things kind of simple. And let's note that generally speaking, what the cortex does is it helps us, among other things, integrate sensory information into a sort of a perceptual experience of the world. So if you're standing outside looking at a beautiful field and you, you can see the colors and you can make out different shapes and you can identify them as different things out in the world around you, grass and hills and trees and the sky and the clouds, and you can feel the wind on your face, and you can smell kind of the, the dust in the air and you can kind of hear the sound of the, you know, the, the the grass or the wheat or whatever it is waving in the breeze, it's very pleasant. All of that is being kind of knit together or put together in different parts of your cortex. So unsurprisingly, drugs which disrupt cortical activity often disrupt this kind of integration of sensory experiences. So not only, but as a good example of this, hallucinogens are drugs which can increase activity in different parts of the cortex. Now, increasing activity sounds good, and maybe in some ways it is good, but that increase in activity can disrupt the sort of fine, delicate balance that the cortex is trying to uh, achieve, such that people who are on hallucinations uh, report distorted perception of the world around them. The word hallucinogens, and I'll get to this in a later lecture, in a way is not a great name for drugs like LSD or PCP or uh, you know uh, psilocybin or, or the drugs which we normally think about as hallucinogens. The name's not good because it suggests that what happens when you take LSD is that you see things which aren't there. You see, oh, I have a hallucination. I'm seeing a, a dragon or a pink elephant or whatever, and it's not there, but I'm seeing it. That rarely happens with hallucinogens. What more commonly happens is the stuff that you are seeing and the stuff that you are experiencing gets muddled or distorted. So we have distorted sensory perception, which may subjectively feel very strange. Like I, I no longer experience this hillside and these trees and this sky as being out there. I feel like I'm kind of bleeding into it or kind of merging with this perceptual field because I've just taken some LSD. And part of why that's happening, as weird as that may be, is it's just increasing activity in different parts of the cortex that disrupts the overall balance of that sensory inter integration. So the cortex, generally speaking, is doing a lot of that work, disruption in that work, has interesting and sometimes even bizarre consequences for how people feel or how they kind of perceive the world around them. Another part of the forebrain, uh, which is worth considering, is the prefrontal cortex. So the frontal cortex, you can see, is uh, colored in red here. It's obviously the part that's sort of in the front of the brain, at least when we sort of orient the brain within the skull uh, the way it is in this picture. The prefrontal cortex is kind of the front top front bit of that frontal cortex. So suffice it to say it's the front of the front uh, of the cortex, kind of the, you know, under, kind of, if you can imagine sort of under the area that's just above your forehead is sort of about where your prefrontal cortex is. And the prefrontal cortex has some interesting you know, is made up of some interesting structures and it has some really interesting functions. These functions include, or are sometimes called executive functions, and as you could imagine from the name, what that has to do with is things like planning and decision making. Um, a lot of what you need to do in your life requires executive functions. So you have to decide in this moment, well, I'm going to sit here and continue listening to this lecture and watching this video, or you need to think, you decide, no, no, it's lunchtime, I'm going to get up and go have some food, or, or um, you know, if you're out, uh, um, you're driving your car, you're making a decision to stay on the road or to drive within a speed limit. Um, all of that kind of planning, which involves thinking ahead, like what will happen if I start speeding or if I swerve off the road? Oh, bad things will happen, so I won't do those, I won't do that behavior. Um, all of that kind of uh, anticipating the future, making plans and dis making decisions, you know, based on what you reckon will happen. Those are all various parts of executive functioning. And what's really interesting is various drugs frankly just decrease the activity of the prefrontal cortex.
So again, one of my favorite drugs to talk about would be alcohol, and alcohol, among its other many messy and interesting effects, decreases activity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, what this may look like for people uh, who are using the drug or using drugs which have this effect is impulsiveness. So people who drink alcohol often Im behave impulsively. They may react violently to a minor insult, or they may, um, you know, if you drink alcohol, you may all of a sudden summon up the courage to go talk to someone who you want to talk to but feel shy about introducing yourself to. You want to meet some attractive girl or you know, or a guy at a party but you feel shy, you feel in, in, inhibited, but after a drink you all of a sudden think, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to make this decision which under other circumstances I would not make because I would fear a future consequence like embarrassment or rejection. That impulsiveness uh, which can have all sorts of forms, uh, occurs for different reasons, but one of them, one of the most important reasons, is that alcohol and other drugs as well decrease the activity of the prefrontal cortex, impairing the functions, the executive functions that normally go into planning. And so to an outside observer, someone who's having these effects, you know, will behave more sort of in a more rash and impulsive way. Of course, these effects can occur in the prefrontal cortex over the long term as well. So someone who's used a drug for a very long period of time, especially a drug which has the effect of deactivating or decreasing activity in the prefrontal cortex, may frankly just show poor decision making about their patterns of use. So this is a, a, you know, a common phenomenon we see when we look at people who are dependent on drugs, who are addicted to drugs, is they're frankly making bad decisions. You know, they keep on using a drug even though it is likely that each use will result in negative consequences. You know, the person who keeps drinking even though every time he drinks, he drinks too much and gets really sick or, or drives his car and risks arrest or accident or worse. Um, someone who continues to use marijuana even though um, they realize it's impairing their functioning at school because it's uh, having negative effects on their memory. These are bad decisions, or at least bad decisions with respect to the types of outcomes that are likely to occur. And as an outsider looking in, you might wonder, why does this person keep on making these bad decisions? Well, part of the story may be damage, or at least, uh, you know, sustained decreased activity in the prefrontal cortex, you know, which looks like kind of loss of control or, or, or bad persistent bad decision making about a very specific set of behaviors, those behaviors that involve drug use. So prefrontal cortex, executive functions, drugs can decrease the activity of those executive functions both in the short term and in the long term. They're all instantiated within the forebrain um, and so they're important to talk about. Now I said before that these distinctions between the, the hindbrain and the midbrain and the forebrain are uh, artificial. Um, they, they are conveniences that over the years neurologists and neurobiologists and anatomists and physiologists have uh, indulged in to help simplify the very complicated and challenging task of sorting through all the different structures and functions within the brain. And the truth is there are systems of structures, connected sets of structures within the brain which span across these different, uh, these different broad regions. Um, one of these, an important one for us to talk about now, is the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. Um, these are uh, neurons which extend from the midbrain up through the limbic system in the forebrain and into the prefrontal cortex. Uh, so they kind of can pass information up this long sort of super highway, um, which we'll talk about in future lectures a lot, but up through the brain from these more basic uh, lower portions of the brain, these sort of subcortical areas up into the higher uh, cortical areas of the brain. Um, we call it mesolimbic because of its sort of location, meso, sort of passing through the limbic system, mesolimbic. We call it dopaminergic because a lot of these neurons use dopamine, which is a chemical neurotransmitter, when they communicate to one another. And in the next lecture, I'm going to be talking about neurotransmitters, including dopamine, but suffice it to say for right now, mesolimbic dopamine dopaminergic pathway or just dopamine pathway is telling us kind of where this pathway, where this system is and how it works in, in, in a general sense, how it accomplishes its communication. You can see here a picture, you know, the resolution I think is fairly good uh, on this. Uh, of the mesolimbic dopamine pathway starting very kind of low in the 
midbrain or kind of high in the hindbrain in the ventral tegmental area that's VTA passing forward um, you know involving the hippocampus and then passing forward uh, through um, the nucleus accumbens and up into the frontal cortex uh, kind of the this pathway I've described so passing through the limbic system involving some of the areas in the limbic system but ultimately kind of passing forward into the frontal cortex now this system has a lot of different uh, functions and you can see some of them noted right here uh, when we say reward salience what we mean is um, you know your world is full of different stimuli some of them are important to you things like food or opportunities to have sex or safety from danger there's things in your world that you ought to pay attention to and there are things that you ought to ignore because they're just not that important to you so i'm sitting in a relatively uh, empty or kind of boring office there's not a lot of reward here but like yeah I look on the uh I look on the, my desk, I have a picture of my children and my wife. Those are rewarding stimuli to me. So they have a certain salience. They sort of pop out as being important. I have a cup of tea in front of me. I like to drink tea. There's a kind of a pleasure involved with drinking it. So that's a rewarding stimulus. There's other stuff in this room that is just not that important to me, like the carpeting or you know, a piece of crumpled paper in my waste paper basket. Those things I can pay attention to if I want to, but they don't exactly pop out when I'm scanning across the room. That's the idea of reward salience. There are some things in the environment that I ought to pay attention to. And there are some things which I can usually just ignore. My mesolimbic dopamine, dopamine pathway allows me to kind of tune in um, on what's important in the world. It can allow me to develop a sense of motivation to behave towards or with regards to those things like I see a picture of my wife and I think oh I should give her a call tell her I love her or you know make some plans for what we're going to do with the kids after work today uh, I see the cup of tea and I think oh I should have another sip of tea um, I'm developing a sense of uh, motivation towards those stimuli um, and you know when I engage in those you know those behaviors about those stimuli I feel a sense of satisfaction like a sense of pleasure like ah I had a nice conversation with my wife or oh I had a nice sip of tea all of that stuff that seems to generally involve organizing behavior towards important goals involves the mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway it involves some of these structures that I've already mentioned which are part of that broader system so again mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway we can call it the reward pathway it helps us detect our rewards in the environment and organize actions to pursue them so if you like sweet desserts you see a picture of this cupcake here it looks delicious you might have a sense of motivation like ooh, I'd like to eat that or obviously I can't because it's on the computer maybe I should go out to a coffee shop and get a cupcake and a cup of coffee that'd be great that feeling you're having right now is your dopaminergic pathway activating And as I've said before, we know that this works in this way in part from research with non-human animals. We can implant an electrode into the brain of a rat or a mouse, say, as you see in this picture, in different areas of the mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway, whether all the way back in the hippocampus or the ventral tegmental area or even further forward. And in general, what we see is when we stimulate that area of the, uh, of, or that system within the brain, the animal behaves in the kind of a a way that is consistent with pursuing a reward or indeed if we allow the animal to stimulate itself by hooking the electrode into a lever or a pedal here you know the rat you know may uh, the rat uh, you know knows that it's uh, if it presses the lever it will uh, get a stimulation or it doesn't really know it but it, it, it understands through through operant conditioning that every time that lever gets pressed or that pedal gets pressed you know that area of its brain is stimulated then the rat will keep on stimulating its brain over and over again it'll even it'll even um, overcome obstacles in order to accomplish that behavior so you could put the rat on the other side of an electrified grid you know most animals including certainly rats and mice which have very sensitive feet don't like to touch electricity I don't either <laughs> most animals don't I suppose but the rat will overcome that obstacle it will overcome the pain associated with crossing that grid just so it can press that lever and get that stimulation and you don't need to think about it too hard I hope to notice that this sounds at least in an analogous way like what drug users do they'll overcome obstacles like uh, you know being rejected by their friends and family or risking uh, prosecution by the law or risking disease or death they'll overcome danger you know they will 
you know, go to dangerous parts of the town where they live, talk to people who are kind of shady just to get the reward that they need. The reward, the drug that's going to stimulate that part of their brain, stimulate that pathway and satisfy that kind of salient reward motivation. I should say this mesolimbic dopaminergic pathway doesn't exist to help us use drugs. You know, the idea that we have from biology based on research and based on the theory of evolution is that this pathway exists to help us pursue important rewards in our life. You know, we need to eat. If we don't, we'll die. We need to have sex. Well, you know, I don't know if you need to have sex, but I think almost all of us want to because you know, we've all, we're all animals that have evolved a motivation to reproduce, or almost all of us have. And so the idea that sex uh, cues associated with sex are rewarding, cues associated with food are re rewarding, cues associated with safety. I didn't put that on the slide here, but it's important. You know, if you're in a dangerous situation, things which look like opportunities for escape really pop out. Like if you're a uh, if you're in an if you're in a room full of people who you don't know and you're feeling anxious and then you see in the corner of the room your friend that person sort of pops out and you think ah safety from the feeling of anxiety safety from the feeling of being shy and you feel motivated to walk over and visit with her or with him so the idea is we have this pathway because we need it because it helps us to survive personally and to survive as a species but what happens with drugs, at least with some drugs, is that they tend to powerfully activate this system such that behavior gets kind of hijacked. And behavior which might normally be directed towards food and sex and safety and kind of, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase, healthy living, gets directed towards drugs. A drug like cocaine, for instance, or even alcohol uh, and other drugs as well, can activate this system in a way that is much more powerful than the activation associated with you know, eating a cupcake or even having sex. And so a person might choose to pursue the drugs over pursuing food or over pursuing uh, sexual relationships with others. I mean, this looks like the way some drug users who are becoming, have become dependent or addicted to drugs, how they behave. They forego rewards. They forego the reward of a healthy family life or a successful career. They give up you know, sex, they give up uh, their own safety or health so as to be able to get the drugs. The drugs are more important to them. And obviously, you don't need the drugs to survive personally. Our species doesn't need the drugs to survive as a species and continue to reproduce. Uh, what has happened is drugs, especially very concentrated, powerful dopaminergic drugs, that is to say dopamine activating drugs, hijack the system. And uh, I'll link to a, a video that describes that in a little bit further detail that I hope you'll find kind of interesting. Anyway, we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, I know this is a lot of information for you. Um, an important point to make, just as a review, I've already said this, but it's worth repeating, is that the drug experience that we have, you know, a user who's using caffeine or using LSD or using marijuana, the experience that he or she has depends in large part on the different structures of the brain and elsewhere in the nervous system, but especially the brain and the central nervous system. How, which structures are most affected by that drug and the types of functions that those structures normally do. If those structures that are affected, if their functions get disrupted, then the consequences will be some of the effects that we associate with being high on heroin, being high on marijuana, being high, if you want to call it that, on caffeine. So that's the important point to take away here. Another idea, and this is something for you to think about and practice on your own, there are a very large number of 3D brain maps that are now available online. It's really been amazing and kind of gratifying for me to look at this just over the last few years that I've been teaching this class and teaching some other classes. Now you can just go to Google and type in 3D brain map and get you know, probably half a dozen good links to different online resources, 3D models of brains, where you can kind of zoom around and look at different structures within the brain, look at information about their different functions. I'll link to a few of these that I like on Blackboard. I encourage you to take a few minutes after watching this video and, you know, 
click around some of those links see if you can find some of the structures i've talked about there's a lot of stuff that i haven't talked about because i didn't have time or i don't frankly have enough knowledge to to really talk accurately about them but see what you can find out and take some time to think about how the brain is put together and some of the amazing functions that it accomplishes if you do that learning later on about various drugs and how those drugs affect the brain i think will be a lot easier for you and also a lot more interesting Okay, so in the next lecture, we're going to continue talking about drugs and the brain, um, but really we're going to focus not on this kind of macroscopic level of structures, but on the more microscopic level of, of well, for the most part, individual cells and the different chemical uh, messengers, the different uh, neurotransmitters that those cells use to communicate with one another. So we'll talk about some cellular structures, we'll talk about communication and different neurotransmitter systems, like the dopamine system that I already talked about. All right, well, as I always say, thank you for your attention. Uh, it's a lot of information in this lecture. I hope it's in stuff that's interesting to you. Uh, take a few minutes, watch some of the supporting material that I've put on Blackboard, uh, but then also take a few minutes just to relax, let this stuff uh, kind of settle in and you know, get instantiated in your brain, hopefully sort of locked into long-term memory. And when you're ready, uh, come back and watch the next video in this series. So again, thank you very much. Bye-bye.